come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used Take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program. Yes, uh, for your information, this is my 25th day in Auckland. Yeah, it's been quite a journey, and uh, I must say it was a journey with uh, mixed emotions. Quite excited, and I felt privileged and honored to be here and share these amazing truths with you from in the Bible. And at the same time, I had days when I was thinking of my dear family, and I was very uh, homesick, but uh, it is beautiful to know that they are very supportive of what I'm doing here. And uh, my little girls were actually praying that uh, everyone might get to hear about Jesus so we can all go home. Please don't miss Saturday evening at 6 p.m. We are going to talk about going home, going to heaven. It's a beautiful message to finish off with. So Saturday night at 6 p.m. we'll be talking about going to heaven. However, tonight is our 22nd presentation, Why So Many Denominations? The Search for the Truth. And this is quite a valid question, and here's the thing. You've got, we've got one Bible, we believe in one God. Why so many denominations? I uh, promise that the truth is going to be challenging, but at the same time, the truth is going to be based upon the Word of God. And if there's going to be something that you may not like, you'll have to address it with God and the Bible, not necessarily with me. I'm just a messenger. <laughs> so I'd like us to bow our heads as we pray before we, we begin tonight. Father, we want to thank you for the gift of life. And I want to thank you that we are here gathered together. We want to draw closer to you. So please, may your spirit be our teacher tonight. Help us to understand your will for our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I'm not sure if you're aware, but there are nearly 34,000 Christian denominations in the world at this very moment. And we're talking about just Christianity, right? We're not talking about any other religion or world religion. Within Christianity, we have 34,000 or just about denomination. And the question arises, why so many? If there's only one God and one Bible, what's wrong with us Christians, isn't it? Well, first of all, we have seen that when Satan attacks, he attacks from within, and he tries to bring in deception, and we have seen that fall away from the truth, and we are going to recapitulate that tonight. But, you know, why so many things? Does God have a church today? 34,000 denomination, is it one that really stands out or is it a group that stands out or all of them are okay? Does it really matter which one? Don't all roads lead to heaven? Well, my friends, I have to tell you that no, not every single road will eventually lead to heaven. The previous sessions we talked about confusion and we talked about Babylon and that massive call, that loud cry from Revelation 17 and then Revelation 18 where God says, Come out of Babylon, my people. If at this very moment we are in a system of religion that does not follow the Bible, my friends, I am uh, in a way forced by the power of the truth to invite you to come out of Babylon. Because those who choose to remain in Babylon will be lost. Those who choose to remain in Babylon, in fact, choose to worship Satan and turn their back to God. This is a life and death decision. It's not a light matter. So does, uh, does it really matter? Of course. Tonight we're going to begin our journey by asking this question, why so many denominations? 
When you look at the Bible, you discover the beautiful picture of the church that is described in the New Testament. And that will be the thing that we'll try to do tonight. Uh, there was one organized New Testament church. That is what the Bible tells us in the passages in Ephesians. There's only one body talking about the body using this metaphor, this analogy saying the head is Christ because he is the leader. So if there's only one head and one body, why so many denominations? There's only one body, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. You can see this oneness. And I know that when Satan tries to attack, he, he brings division. So we have to come back to this idea of unity. The Bible also tells us there was only one belief system in the New Testament. If you remember last night and the day before, we looked at the false doctrines that have been promulgated through the church in the past centuries. However, we have only one faith. Uh, same verse, but we've got the idea of one faith emphasized, not multiple ideas. You know, you may believe this, and I believe this. It doesn't really matter. No, it does matter. Because the Bible says very, very clearly, there's one Lord, there is one church, and there is one faith. Because when God is in charge, there is that unity. Now, uh, earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the Saints. So he talks about faith not as an abstract idea or notion, but rather as a system of core beliefs or doctrines. And he says this system of beliefs and doctrines, they were passed on, they were delivered unto the saints, and you need to hold on to them. If you have lost them, you need to regain them. And this is what the Bible will help us to do. Now God's plan is one united church. Uh, he said, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. Jesus was praying. He was crying for that unity. So what is happening at this very moment in the world? It is not God's will for Christians. It's not God's will. Also in 1 Corinthians, it says that there should be no schism in the body, which is the church. And we have 34,000 denominations. We've got a problem, especially when we follow the same Bible. And number four, which is the last point I want to bring at this stage, the Bible predicted a departure from the New Testament truth. This is the amazing thing about God. Nothing surprises Him. He knows everything. He knows the end from the beginning. Not only He knows that, He wants you to know that the end from the beginning. That's why in the Bible, written 2,000 years ago, He said, you know, even though this is the truth, there is going to be a falling away from the truth. And I want you to be aware of it because I want you to return to the true source of the truth. In 1 Timothy, Paul wrote this, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times... So it's not about Paul's time. It wasn't to do 10 years later, but as we get closer to the end of time, there's going to be something tragic. In the latter time, some shall depart, so not everyone, but some shall depart from the faith, which is that system of teachings, beliefs, doctrines that were passed on by Jesus and His disciples. Some will depart from that, giving heed to Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. My friends, the battle in the world at this very moment is about worship. Who you worship and how you worship. And it's based on the idea of doctrines, the teachings of God. Because you have the true teachings of God in the Bible and then you've got the, the doctrines of the devils. And as we have seen, the counterfeit is so close to the truth that you can hardly see the difference but last night we read that famous Bible verse from Isaiah 8, 20 that says to the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. There is no light in them. So in the first century, you know, the idea of Christianity was formed. Then in the second and third century, you started to have a bit of a falling away from the truth and it was a very gradual one not all of a sudden like it was step by step by step then in the fourth century we have Roman Emperor Constantine that became the first 
a, a Christian emperor. And with him, the empire in a way became Christian. But at the same time, Christianity became pagan because pagan beliefs entered the Christian church. It was all of a sudden this, this overlap that was happening between paganism and Christianity in order for all of them to survive at the same time. The church fell away from the truth and I'd like you to bear in mind it was a gradual falling away. Have you heard of the experiment with the frog and the hot water? So if you grab a pot, you can try this at home. <laughs> Grab a pot, fill it with water, and boil the water. When the water is boiling, try to throw a frog inside. Just try. The frog will jump out because it's not its environment. However, if you have the same pot and now you just put normal temperature water and you put the frog inside, and you start heating the pot, the frog will stay there until it dies. Because the heat was gradual and it ended up killing the frog. When deception started to come into the church, it was a gradual one to the point that people no longer noticed that. It wasn't all of a sudden to blind them and shock them and say, no, 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 we can't have this. Now it was gradual. Oh, yeah, we, we'll do it just now. We'll accept this one now. The church started to fall away from the truth. In uh, 4th century, year 321, uh, one of the major changes was the day of worship. And Christianity around the world today are still following a pattern that is not Bible-based, my friends. And look, some of you have been through this 21 uh, presentation tonight, 22. Uh, we have seen in the Bible that this is not God's ideal. This is, what, is, this is not what He set aside for creation. And in fact, He calls us out of confusion. He calls us out of Babylon. He calls us out of man-made rules, regulations, and faiths. Because He wants us to follow Him. And the change was made in 321 uh, A.D. When Sunday, the first day of the week, became a day of worship that replaced the seventh day of the week, the Sabbath that was initiated by God. Now, I'm going to take you through a number of... Uh, of uh, statistics that represent the church's fall from the truth. I'm not going to read all the years, it will take too long, but I would like you to look at that. For example, in the 4th century, towards the end of the 4th century, the worship of Mary was introduced. For 4th century, they weren't worshipping her, but then all of a sudden they said, how about we worship her? How can you worship a dead person when the Bible said the dead know Nothing. The dead are sleeping. They're waiting for the resurrection of Jesus Christ. How can he end up worshiping someone? Well, first of all, it was an overlap of paganism and Christianity. Later on, 5th century, they started to baptize children, infant baptism. Because they said, immersing people, adults, is a bit too inconvenient. They're getting wet. So we might as well sprinkle the babies. It's much easier. So that was introduced in the 5th century, 8th century. Uh, worship of images and saints, which is a full uh, attack against the second commandment. You shall make yourself no graven images. No wonder the second commandment was removed, select all, delete, from uh, the catechism of the medieval church. Because that was a, a, a direct contrast. Moving on, 12th century, you've got baptism by immersion seized completely. Even though it was practiced maybe both, now it ceased completely. And then he moved on to celibacy of priests. So for that period of a thousand years, he didn't have it. And all of a sudden, it's introduced. Why? Because the fall was a gradual one. You've got confession to priests. And this is a very sad one because the Bible says when you confess your sins, confess them to God because you sin against Him and He's the only one that can forgive you. But then it was introduced in that year, 1215 A.D., that you can't confess your sins to God. You need to confess them to your priest, and the priest can speak on your behalf to God, which is not biblical, and the falling away from the truth was a gradual one. And if you can, because I'd imagine all of you came with your brain tonight here. Just think of this statement. A Christian church 
made the rule that Bible reading is forbidden. Can you comprehend that? A Christian church forbidding the Bible from the people. How can you reconcile the two unless you believe what Jesus said that there's going to be a falling away from the truth that people will give heed to seducing spirits and to the doctrines of demons. Later on in the 16th century, the church tradition ended up being greater than the Bible. It was placed above the scripture. And what's fascinating is that throughout all of these centuries, different people started to, to bring that idea of reformation and going back to the Bible. You know, very few Testament church beliefs remain intact through this period of time. Very few. As you can see, a lot of error was introduced. One of them was this that remained. Matthew 28, verses 18 and 19, and it says this. This is Jesus himself speaking to his disciples before he ascended into heaven. And he said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And he said, Make disciples in what manner? By baptizing them in the name. And I want you to understand this is singular because baptism is in the name of Jehovah Lord God. But Jehovah is three in one in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Spirit. It's not in their names, but rather in the name because all three are one and one is three. This is the mystery of Trinity, the idea of one in three in God. And what's fascinating, this truth of the Trinity was actually preserved by the Catholic Church throughout the generation. So I really appreciate that about that. I like that about the Church of Rome. You, you've heard me through the past sessions talking a lot about the, the heresies they have in, incorporated or promoted or you know, created. But one thing they did, well, maintaining this teaching, this Bible-based doctrine that God is, is three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We know that in 538, uh, Roman Emperor Justinian, he gave that political power to the bishop in Rome, so they uh, began that period of 1,260 years of authority, both secular and religious, was a time of control over Europe and a time of persecution. And the Dark Ages began in 538 uh, AD. Throughout this time, there were many calls for reformation of the Dark Age Church. People were trying to say, look, we are moving away from the Bible. We need to return to this book because the things we are doing are not according to this. And what was the result of that? The result was persecution. People were killed. People were burned. People were removed because they were fighting against a powerful system. So the Bible ended up being banned. In a, in a continent, Europe, that claimed to be Christian, this book was banned. It was illegal to have it in a continent that claimed to be Christian. Not only that, they had a great collection and the priests actually burned it. Why? They were taking information away from people so, he, so they can control them and manipulate them. If you take information away from them, you take knowledge and you take power away from them. So this book was gradually removed so no one can come back with ideas of reformation. It was forbidden to be translated. So people were actually forced to listen to a message in a language that they did not understand. And that was in most cases Latin. So they had the Bible, the priest had the Bible in Latin. He would sing the verses in Latin. The person would show up on a Sunday morning in their situation, sit down through something they didn't understand, and they went home saying, we worshipped God. No wonder people had no idea about the truth of the Bible. No wonder that they just accepted things because, well, if the person told me, it must be true. They were ignorant. In Revelation 12, we, we have this period described in this manner. The dragon persecuted the woman. We know the woman is the church, right? Who gave birth to the male child. 
Now the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed there, should feed her there for 1,260 days. And this was the prophetic period of time. We know that the medieval church persecuted the faithful Christians for 1,260 years because we apply the principle one day for a year in prophecy. But during this time of persecution, during this time of darkness, a match was struck and light started to come again because God could not stand could not suffer his children being in ignorance. Martin Luther was one of them in the 16th century that uh, he was actually a Catholic monk. And as he was reading the Bible, he discovered one amazing truth, that the Bible should be the only source of our faith. And uh, he said, you know, all Scripture is inspired by God. The Scripture is the one that is inspired by God. Nothing else, not tradition, not the, the, the rituals that we might have. It is the Bible alone that is inspired by God. So he started to say, hang on, guys. We need to place that tradition aside, and we need to give uh, first place to this special book. As he was reading, he discovered that we are saved by grace alone. And the Bible verse Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, and says, For by grace he have been saved through faith. And this was revolutionary, especially in his century, because people were encouraged, not only encouraged, but they were scared into doing that, into, you know, climbing things on their knees and waking up or beating themselves in order to make sure that they will be saved. Whereas as Martin Luther was reading the Bible, it says, hang on a minute, it says, salvation comes through faith is an act of grace. It is God's mercy. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is the gift of... How much does a gift cost? It's free. And that's what Martin couldn't reconcile with. You know, why are we doing all of these things? Why are we requesting all of these things from people when salvation is a gift? And he goes on saying, not of works so that no one can boast. And they say, we've got it all wrong. What he was trying to do, he was trying to bring reformation within his own church. As I said, he was a, a Catholic monk. He was just trying to bring reformation. He said, my friends, my church, we just need to go back to this book. This is the inspired book. This is our faith. This is our foundation. This is our doctrine. This is given by God, inspired by him. And of course, they kicked him out. And the Lutheran church was formed. And what I appreciate about the Lutheran church is that they brought the Bible back into the midst of the people. And secondly, they brought the idea of salvation by grace into the midst of people. All of a sudden, people had hope that they can be saved by God's grace. But there was more light yet to come back to God's church. Why? Because it took hundreds and hundreds of years for the church to fall away from the truth, and the church was in a way regaining everything they, they once had, or they lost, right? And this is the beautiful thing about God. When God takes you back on a journey of revealing things to you, He doesn't dump the whole thing on you. Here you go, manage it. I hope you do well. Now, He gives you one step at a time. Enough light so you can take another step. So, you know, if you've spent a lot of time in a cave, in a dark cave, you need time, you need gradual uh, procession in order for your eyes to adjust to the light. And the same thing God was doing with His church. Proverbs 4, 18, beautiful verse, says, The path of the righteous is like the first gleam of dawn, shining ever brighter till the full light of day. So it goes from bright to brighter, brighter, and it goes to the full uh, light of day. So it's a gradual journey. After Martin Luther, there was another uh, fellow by the name of John Calvin, still part of the Catholic Church. And uh, he was looking after the church in uh, Geneva, Switzerland. And as he was studying the Bible himself, he discovered one principle that was placed aside. And the principle was the sovereignty of God, that ultimately God is in control. And he had this verse in Romans 8, 29 that says, And we know that all things, how many things? 
All things work together for good to those who love God. So all things, which this verse tells us, God is not the author of all things, because we know the evil one is in the world. He, you know, he does a lot of you know, terrible stuff. But God is saying, eventually, all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to His purpose. And what John Calvin was saying, ultimately, God is in control, and He will deal with the situation. Secondly, which was powerful, coming from John Calvin, was the security and assurance of salvation. He said, look, you don't have to spend the rest of your life doubting and wondering What's going to happen with my eternity? The Bible is very clear in 1 John 5. He who has the Son has life. And these things I have written to you that you may know that you have eternal life. You have, not you might have, not you will have, not you had, but you have. Get the grammar right. <laughs> You have, as in present, you have that assurance now. And I believe some of us might actually struggle with that. But God wants us to be at peace. He who has the Son has life. When? Now. You know, God wants you to go home tonight, and He wants you to put your head on the pillow and to, for you to be at peace because you have the Son of God in your heart. However, if you do not have Jesus in your heart, tonight is a good time to invite Him in. Why should you be away from God when you can be in His arms? So uh, as a result of the work that John Calvin did, the Reformed churches were born, Presbyterian church as well. So something they brought to the table was the sovereignty of God, and secondly, the security and assurance of uh, salvation in Jesus Christ, and this is something that I really appreciate by the work that John Calvin and the Presbyterian and the Reformed Church. Can you all see what I'm doing here? There was a gradual falling away from the truth. Why do we have so many denominations? That is the question we're answering tonight, my friends. Why? Because God is gradually rebuilding His truth back into people's minds and hearts, and he does that gradually, because we cannot bear it all of a sudden. So that's why we have this transition. So more lot yet to come back to God's church. You know, that wasn't enough. And we meet this fellow, an Anglican by the name of John Smith. In 1607, he left England for Holland. And while he was there one year later, Smith was baptized by immersion like Jesus Christ. As they was like, wow, that's something new. That's what they thought because they haven't done it for centuries. And uh, as a result of that, his followers set up the first Baptist church in 1612, which comes from baptism according to the Bible by immersion. And another truth was given back to God's church that was stolen away from them. Colossians 2.13, it's a beautiful verse because it describes the experience of a person as they go through the ritual of baptism, as they are immersed in the water and they come out. They talk about the death you can experience to the old person, but at the same time, the resurrection. Look how Paul puts it in Colossians. Buried with Him, referring to Jesus Christ, buried with Jesus in baptism, in which you also were raised with Him, Jesus, through faith in the working of God, who raised Him from the dead. So not only you are buried, but you are raised through faith in the working of God with a new identity. And I'm really grateful to the Baptist Church for the work they had done, because they brought the baptism by immersion back into the midst of God's people. Another truth was restored. We are on the way up now. Uh, more light yet to come. John Wesley, some of you might uh, be familiar with this name. He was an Anglican, but he was a bit disappointed because the church started to become very formal, but no essence, no meaning, 
no relevance. So as he was studying the Bible, he said, hang on, the Bible tells us something very important. Christ actually wants to live in us. That is what gives us the joy of life. That is what gives us the power to overcome sin. That is what gives us meaning and purpose, that Christ wants to live in me. It's not just about a head knowledge that I check in once a week. It's an experiential one every day of the week. And the verse, Galatians 2, 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And as John Wesley was contemplating on this truth that as Christians we need to die to self at baptism, but what happens after that? Christ gets to live in you. And as he was promoting this amazing truth of a true Christian life, full of meaning, full of fire, full of purpose and mission, the Methodist Church was born. And what I appreciate about the Methodist Church is that it brought this idea of living like Christ, His life in us, which was very essential to Christianity. So here we have the idea of truth being restored before God's people. Truth, 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 and the truth was being built back again. This wall of truth was once demolished, but now was again being rebuilt. In 538, uh, because of the decisions that were made in the world then, the world entered this dark tunnel. We call it the Dark Ages. It was a dark tunnel for Christianity as well, and they stayed there for 1,260 years. And then when it finished in 1798, they were coming out of the dark tunnel. They were coming back into light. Each group that I just mentioned, they had some Bible truth, but none had all of it. Why? Because God was gradually restoring the truth. It was only that much that we you know, could handle back then. So we know that in 1798, we discussed this at length last night. It was the period of the, the end of the 1,260 years. And we also discovered, based on the prophecy from Dan, uh, Revelation 10, it began the time of the... So it's not the end of time, but rather the time of the end. It's a nice play on words, which means we're living on the knife edge of eternity when this world is going to collapse. We looked at the book of Daniel that was sealed... Uh, especially that prophecy, outstanding prophecy the, of 2,300 days uh, concerning the time of the end. And even though, I mean, we, that, prophet, that time finished in 1798, and what happened after that, the book was unsealed. We looked at the French Revolution that triggered people into studying prophecy and say, is Jesus really coming now? Look at all the things that are happening in the world. And that what motivated many people from different denominations, because we've got all these denominations now, to actually study Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, that prophecy of the 2,300 years. And as they were studying, they came to the conclusion that something must take place in 1844, because that's what they saw in prophecy. You know, the prophecy of 2,300 years finished in 1844 and said a special event is going to take place in 1844. What was that event? Well, a farmer, a Baptist farmer by the name of William Miller, he believed that it was the return of Jesus. And we talked about it, that experience it was sweet in the mouth but bitter in the stomach. Sadly, he was disappointed and that day went down into history as the great disappointment. And here's the thing, when things do not line up, the best thing we can do is go back to the Bible and ask ourselves, what did we get wrong? So again, you've got an interdenominational group, people from all these different groups coming together and say, what did it go wrong? You know, what's, what's wrong with this? Let's study more. And as they were studying, they look at the phrase, cleansing of the sanctuary. This is something that we discussed last night, so I'm just, you know, briefly reminding you of. Uh, it actually meant that God's judgment began in 1844. It was an antitype of the judgment 
of Yom Kippur, that thing that was taking place once a year in the Old Testament. But now it was showing that Jesus is starting a period of judgment, which means if Jesus started the period of judgment, he is judging people because he brings his reward. He comes to bring his reward. And it was the Bible study that really led them to truth. And as they were studying together to find these things, they, uh, they, they, they could see that you know, baptism had to be by immersion. But as they were studying, they also discovered that death is a sleep. Death is a peaceful sleep. You know, I've got all these funerals where, you know, we, we may hear that, you know, people, the loved ones that have passed away are looking down from heaven. But that's not what the Bible says, my friends. Those that have passed away are asleep. They are peacefully at rest. And the greatest uh, element of hope that Jesus has given us is the resurrection that takes place when Jesus returns. That's why it's important that once this you know, seminar finishes, Pastor Ian will read these, these groups because as we come together, open the Bible, just amazing things happen. That's what these guys did in, in that time after 1844. And as they were reading the Bible, they said, we've been worshiping on a day that has no substance in the Bible. There's no foundation for it. And as they were studying the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, they said, we have to return to the seventh-day Sabbath, given by God at creation before sin, placed in the hearts of the commandments, kept by Jesus and his disciples, prophesied by Isaiah that he's going to be in the new earth. So we might as well keep it here while we're waiting for Jesus. And it was during this time that the Seventh-day Adventist church was born. And it was all these building blocks, one on top of another, because God was restoring His beautiful truth. So we've got in the world 34,000 Christian denominations. How do we know which church is the right one? Does God have a church today? John 10 tells us there will be one flock and one shepherd. He is the shepherd. There's no doubt about it. It's all about being part of his flock, being part of his faithful children, embracing the truth that he has given us. Not only that, the book of Revelation talks about God's end time church that is called the remnant. Because while you may have the church, the church in a way has moved away from the truth. That's why out of the church, God has a remnant, which is a smaller group that remains faithful to God. Look at the, the, the words of this verse, Revelation 12. The dragon was angry with the... And the woman represents... But pay attention, he does not fight with the woman, does he? He went to make war with the remnant of her seed. Because while he was successful in bringing deception, now he's focusing on the remnant because there is something really outstanding about this remnant. So which church is God's prophetic remnant? The book of Revelation gives us five identifying characteristics. Number one, keep God's commandments. Revelation 12, 17 says, And the dragon went to make war with the remnant of her seed. And here's a description. Who keep the commandments of, of God. So God's church at the end of time will be a church that does uphold all ten commandments. And I'd like to suggest to you that it's all about all ten. I would say the majority of Christians don't have a problem with all nine. There's a bit of a struggle with the fourth one. And I'm here to remind you that the fourth one is still there. It wasn't removed by God. Why? Just because just you've got your brain with you tonight, just think for a second. Why should we keep the nine and not that particular one? Why should we uphold and embrace the nine 
but not that particular one that talks about the Sabbath. Why? But as the dragon, Satan, fights against the remnant, these are a group of people that are willing to embrace all ten. Why? Because they love Jesus. And they're willing to follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Remember the question from Revelation uh, at the end of chapter 6, beginning of 7? When Jesus will return, who will be able to stand? We've got the number 144,000, those who are sealed, but those who are willing to follow the Lamb. And you follow Jesus in everything that He has given us, including the seven-day Sabbath. Also, this, this remnant has the faith of Jesus. This is how Revelation puts it. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. And as we said, faith is more than just an abstract notion. It is actually a set of teachings that Jesus himself has passed on to his people. So what is faith in Jesus all about? Well, in understanding that we can be forgiven, that salvation is a gift. It's been provided by God, that we can have a new life that we can also have victory over Satan. And these are, you know, clear and embraced by majority of Christians. But faith is also extended to the teaching and doctrines of Jesus. He said, uh, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. So faith is a, is a set of teachings that God has created and Satan has come with the counterfeit. And here's the faith of Jesus. Baptism by immersion. He himself was baptized by immersion. Uh, he, when Lazarus, his friend, passed away, he said, Lazarus is sleeping. So Jesus called death a sleep. He didn't say, don't worry, guys. There's no need to cry. Lazarus is watching us from heaven. He's, he's enjoying a good time. No. He said, death is asleep. Uh, he said, that I will return, and when I return, everyone will see me. There is nothing secret about Jesus' return. There is no secret rapture, as some might be familiar with about this idea. He returns in a visible way. Also, in Luke 4, chapter, Luke chapter 4, verse 16, it says, Jesus went to synagogue according to his custom on a Sabbath day. Custom, which means he did it on a regular basis. He came up with the idea at creation, and of course, he kept that on earth. And uh, Healthful Living saying that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We need to be aware of what we put in. If we put rubbish in, rubbish out. We need to understand that this is a holy place where God dwells. I mean, what a privilege. God dwelling within us. And of course, you've got uh, the idea of tithing, which you talked on Saturday morning. It is a test of putting God first and acknowledging that He owns everything and I am just a manager. I am a steward. And it's a reminder, Abel, remember, this is not your stuff. You are managing it. And you need to do your very best at managing that. So faith, uh, that a teaching of Jesus, is actually to embrace everything He taught. Uh, number three, criteria number three. This remnant actually proclaims the three angels messages. At the end of Revelation 10, we, we read about that movement that was going to do a very important mission. And he said to me, you must prophesy again. And this mission wasn't just a local mission, but he said, you must prophesy again to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings, which means this message is so vital, is so important, it is so essential that every single human being needs to hear it. And of course, is the description of the remnant church because uh, the message is repeated in the first angel's message where you see another angel flying in the midst of heaven with a message to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people saying with a loud voice, the hour of his judgment has come. So the third characteristic is that this is a church that proclaims the message globally and the message is, judgment has begun in 1844. Number four, this is the second last one. It is a global movement because the message is preached to every single person on, human, on, on planet Earth. 
And number five, it emerges after 1798. God prophesied the birth of a church with a specific message for a specific time such as this. God is so interested in your salvation that He prophesied the birth of a church with a specific message. And He said the woman fled into the wilderness that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So what emerged after that period of time? And the dragon was angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant, not with the woman, but the remnant of her Seed. So here we have a remnant that is a prophetic end time movement of God. The five identifying features keep God's commandments, has the faith of Jesus, proclaims the three angels' messages. It is a global movement and emerges after 1798. Which church is God's prophetic remnant? Before I share that, let me take you to Palestine. There's a well there known as ja Jacob's Well, and it describes the story from Gospel of John, chapter 4, where Jesus meets a Samaritan woman. And they have a talk about worship, they have a talk about salvation, they have a talk about truth. And this is what Jesus said to this woman. You worship what you do not know. Have you ever felt like that? Worshipping something that you do not know? But Jesus said, we know what we worship. For salvation is of the Jews. Was that a bit arrogant of Jesus to say that? He said, you do not know what you worship. For salvation is of the Jews. What he meant by saying that was this. Everyone on planet earth is still a child of God. However, the Jews had a specific message to share and the Messiah was going, was going to come from the Jewish line. Everyone was still a child of God, but the Jews had a special message of salvation that they had to share. The hour of His coming, and now it is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such worship. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. Christ wasn't arrogant. But He was saying, out of all the nations, the Jews have a clearer understanding of God. They have a clearer understanding of the truth. It doesn't mean they are more special. It doesn't mean they are loved more by God. All it means is they have a greater responsibility. And we need to accept that Messiah came from the Jews. So, in a way, it helps us to, to ponder this question. Which church is God's prophetic remnant? Well, there's only one church that fits all the criteria, that keeps all the commandments, or strives, you know, to keep all the commandments, including the Sabbath that has the faith of Jesus with all its biblical teachings, not Babylonian teachings. It is a church that proclaims the three angels' messages. It is a global movement. And actually, it emerged. Its birth was prophesied that will emerge after 1798. And the church is the church you find yourselves in tonight. The Seventh-day Adventist church. It was prophesied that it will come to fulfillment with a specific message. And don't misunderstand me. It doesn't mean that God doesn't have His children all over the world, in all the churches, in all religions. All religions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Islam. Because that's why last night we talked about God's call, come out of Babylon. My people. God calls His people out of confusion from wherever they might be. God has His own children everywhere, in every system, every religion, every faith. That's why He calls them out. But when it comes to the birth and the formation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, God placed a specific message of restoration of the truth. All it means is that there's a greater responsibility for this group to bring something to the table 
that others have ignored. In this church, we try to uphold the commandments of God, including commandment number four, the Sabbath that sadly has been forgotten by Christians around the world, even though the commandment starts with the word, remember. Why do we have to ignore it if the word starts with remember? As a church, we believe in the faith of Jesus, that we receive forgiveness, salvation, new life, and victory over Satan and sin because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. We believe in baptism by immersion. We believe that death is just a sleep. We believe that when Jesus will return, every eye will see him and every ear will, he will hear him. There will be nothing secret about that. We believe that God wants us to stop on the seven-day Sabbath. In our context, it's Saturday. He wants us to disconnect from the world in order to connect with Him. And uh, He wants us to look after our bodies because we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And He wants us to put Him first to remember that He is the giver of everything, the owner of what we have, and we are the, uh, the stewards, managers. As a church, we have embraced the message of the three uh, angels' messages, the, the mission to proclaim uh, that God is, you know, calling people out of Babylon. Judgment began. And at the same time, we are a truly global church because our mission is not just about Auckland. It's about every nation, kingdom, tongue, and people to bring the message of salvation. And do you know why we are so passionate about it? I want to read to you a verse from Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 14, says this, And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. That's why I am passionate about sharing the gospel. That's why as a church we are passionate about sharing the truth, because we want Jesus to return. We want to go home. We want to be with Him in heaven forever. But we don't want to be there by ourselves. We want you to be there too. That's why we're here, sharing this. And God, above all, He wants you to be there. Because He says, out of Babylon I have called you. You are my child. And of course, as a church, we have emerged after 1798, officially founded in 1863. The remnant is the one that calls people out of Babylon with the purpose of preparing them for the return of Jesus Christ. And now we're going to finish with this beautiful verse that comes from John. And they are the very words of Jesus, the best way to finish with, with the words of Jesus. And just pay attention. Let the words just sink into your heart and mind. Jesus says, I am the good isn't that wonderful news that Jesus is good and he's a shepherd looking after us? And if we are straying away, he's searching for you and for me. And the reason why you're here tonight is because he is searching for you. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. And he said, I know my sheep. He knows you. The Bible says he knows even the hairs on your head. Some of us, it's easier to count them than others. <laughs> he knows our hairs. He knows everything about us. He knows when you're good, and he knows when you're bad. And he loves you anyway, because you are his child. And look what it says, my sheep know me. The question we need to ask ourselves, do we know God? Do we know Jesus? Do we have a close, real, genuine, intimate relationship with God? Do we take the time to be in His presence? His sheep actually know Him. Jesus says, I laid down my life for the sheep. It's one of the most important aspects of this verse. He says, other sheep I have which are not of this fold. In other words, He says, I've got my children and they are everywhere, including in Babylon. And I'm calling them out of confusion. I'm calling them out of a system that does not uphold the Bible. I'm calling them out of a system that has ignored the true teaching of the Word. Them also I must 
bring. He is passionate about you leaving Babylon behind and joining the remnant, sharing the message, be true to the Bible, and have the faith of Jesus Christ. Jesus is passionate about you leaving Babylon behind, that you may join the remnant. And look what it says. They will hear my voice. These sheep, they are, they are part of other flock, and they will come. They will come out of Babylon, they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock, and there will be one shepherd. My question tonight is this. Are you hearing Jesus' voice calling you into a clear and more meaningful relationship with him? Calling you out of confusion into a beautiful relationship with Jesus Christ in his church, the remnant. As you ponder upon this question, if you're hearing the voice of Jesus calling you, I'd like my friends to quickly um, hand you out a, a response card. This is our last one we're going to do in this series. Because there's no point in me asking you a question if you do not have the opportunity to actually answer. And what the question is all about is if you're willing to leave Babylon behind, to hear the voice of Jesus and join him in the remnant church. The first question that we're looking at is, I claim Jesus as my savior. It's not a question, but I claim Jesus as my savior and surrender all to him. If you haven't done this in the past, my question to you tonight is, what is it that holds you back from doing this? The world has nothing to offer you that will bring you peace and meaning in life. There's nothing like Jesus. Second point, I understand that the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the remnant church of the Bible prophecy, and I want to be part of this remnant. God doesn't love us more than He loves others, but God wants us to be part of a church that embraces the truth and is passionate about sharing a message that will bring light and salvation to others. And number three, I want to follow Jesus and be baptized by immersion like Him. There's something powerful about the act of baptism, a true experience that we are immersed in the water and I make a decision as a person to die to self that I may be raised in the power of Jesus Christ to a new life. Please take the time to write your name and a contact number. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep. And my sheep, they know me. I lay down my life for the sheep. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring. And they will hear my voice. And there will be one flock and one shepherd. I'd like us to pray tonight as we have made these decisions. Now, these will be decisions not only on a piece of paper, but they will be decisions on our hearts and on our minds that we will be serious to follow Jesus in every aspect of our life because that will truly bring fulfillment, joy, satisfaction, and of course, eternal life. Let us pray. Father, we want to thank you for Gethsemane. We want to thank you that uh, in that garden you made the decision to die on the cross for us. And Father, I want to thank you that in your wonderful love you are calling us out of darkness. You are calling us to come out of confusion. You are calling us to come out of Babylon into your true light. That we may be your children, your remnant that has a powerful liberating message to share with people around us. Father, I pray that you will bless the decisions that have been made here tonight. Bless those that have made these decisions. And may they be serious. And I ask, Lord, that uh, nothing and no one will stop us from truly following you. Tonight we have heard your voice. And we want to follow you wherever you may lead us. May you bless us, keep us safe. 
Help us to continue to reflect on the things we have heard here tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on a journey to lost civilizations. See ancient artifacts and long lost ancient scrolls. The strange writing on this clay brick is known as cuneiform. Now the script was used Take the journey of a lifetime and travel to ancient Babylon and the island of Patmos to discover how ancient mysteries reveal the future. A live seminar series. Don't miss any program.